Welcome to Real Vision Crypto. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, I speak with Anders Brownworth, Principal Software Architect at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston about an incredibly important topic, CBDCs, Central Bank Digital Currencies. Welcome back, Anders. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here again. Anders, it's a great pleasure to have you back. Obviously, an incredibly important topic we're talking about here today. Give us a little bit of the context uh, of who's involved in this, what the structure is, and what you guys are doing. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, these are all my opinions, not the opinions of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston or, or the Federal Federal Reserve in general. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston has been working uh, for the past almost two years now with MIT on this uh, project where we're building a hypothetical central bank digital currency software code base that allows us to test uh, you know, many different uh, ways of architecting such a system and really trying to suss out, you know, what's possible, what does current technology allow, what's not possible, uh, and, uh, you know, essentially come up with a, a menu of options of different ways you could build this and, and uh, you know, hopefully inform people that are, uh, you know, at a much higher pay grade than myself making decisions about uh, policy and how we should, uh, you know, think about this and, and you know, how we move forward. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, this is extraordinarily exciting. Uh, I think that people may not realize that there are actually projects, pilot projects right now that are being done, actual code being built, testing some of the ideas, some of the concepts behind what a central bank digital currency might actually look like. Yeah, I don't think you can really uh, understand something uh, deeply unless you, you really go and build it. And and that's been the, the yeah. guiding principle here. Uh, you know, we connected with the... Uh, uh, digital currency initiative, the DCI at MIT, and, and they've already been doing a, a bunch of thought in this area. And we're very excited about, you know, let's actually boil this down to a code base and let's uh, really put it through its paces and test it. And, and I think, you know, that, that's how you learn. Uh, you got to build it. So let's talk about building it. What are some of the design principles? What are some of the goals? How are you thinking about this at the 50,000 foot level in terms of what the actual sort of, I guess, business requirements would be in the business world, but the technological requirements, what does this system need to do to be a success in your view? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so you know, to boil it down to one simple word, the, an the answer is fast. Okay, It's got to be quick. So you might look at like all the credit card transactions happening uh, in, in the world, all of the cash transactions, everything that's happening on, on Swift and ACH, and maybe come up with an idea of like, what, what do we do now? Uh, it's actually kind of hard to figure that out, but you can back into estimates. And, you know, let's just put that at, let's say, 100,000 transactions a second. Let's say well, that's kind of what it is. And it's in that, that order. So uh, let's build a system here that tries to reach 100,000 transactions a second and then clear them to finality within five seconds. Uh, and then they're obviously, you know, you have to do that securely. You have to, you know, you have to do that uh, uh, scalably, et cetera. So, so you know, that, that was basically the, the goalpost there. Let's, let's try to make this thing, you know, what, what we'll call fast. Uh, so we did that. We we put those requirements out there, and then we we took several different attempts. Actually, we started with one idea and a way to do that, and uh, we got some numbers. We were able to put some numbers on the board that that you know actually beat those numbers. Uh, and mm -hmm. then we we came to this really interesting point where we 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 had a question. We said, "Well, why can't we do this differently?" And we really pivoted. And made a system that, as far as we're aware, probably linearly scales. So we're able to very significantly beat those numbers. Uh, so that's that's uh, you know that's what we did. And, and and to be clear, you know, this is a research code base that we're working on here. This is something that is meant to be very flexible and try different things very very quickly. Uh, and it does that. Uh, but all it is at its very core is a transaction processor. That's that's all we're, we're really trying to do. We're not trying to answer all the myriad questions around what would surround that, like how do you get into the system, et cetera. But how would you make a transaction processor do that? 
Now, in order to do that, we had to build some of those things. We'd had to kind of make ways for, for us to get transactions through the system, et cetera. But uh, we, we, in a sense, punted on some very critical pieces so that we could concentrate on, on really making something that was rip-roaring fast. Yeah, and just to give people a little bit of context on how fast 100,000 transactions per second is, uh, Bitcoin, I think, is around 5 to 10 transactions a second. It's often uh, compared to, for example, credit card processing. Uh, Visa, I think, is averaging around 2,000 transactions per second. This is blazing fast. You know, if, if you look at a cryptocurrency, let's say Bitcoin, it's very, the Bitcoin nodes are very monolithic. They do everything from run the chatty, you know, uh, network where it's moving transactions around the mempool it's kind of you know managing that it's it's managing the state it's checking uh transactions and it's it's a full participant in the the network in in a single stack and if you think about it like a lot of those things can be parallelized uh and you know why wouldn't you so if you can parallelize those things and run them across many machines you can basically break that up into a set of things that can be paralyzed and a set that can't. Turns out, really, there's only one thing that can't effectively be parallelized. Uh, and uh, so we did that. And as it turns out, if you do that and you really, really refine each of those levels, you can, you can reach some pretty impressive numbers. Uh, and uh, I, I will add, uh, in order to do this, not only did we have to kind of lower down the list on the, you know, we had speed and we had uh, security down lower on the list was like, we need to do this uh, uh, geographically, uh, you know, uh, disparate. We had to have pieces of the, this system in geographically different places and only consider transactions final when they were replicated across that network. So how do you do all of those things yeah. yet do it like blazingly fast? And the answer is you got to, you got to, split it up and do the things that you can parallelize, uh, you know, in, in different layers. Uh, so that's what we did. I mean, the scale of this project is is almost astonishing when you think about what the requirements are in terms of speed, in terms of uh, geographic distribution. Uh, it really incredibly massive project that you guys are working on right now. Anders, maybe uh, one thing that might be helpful to people, uh, you talk about some of the the design sort of structural decisions. Perhaps you might compare it a bit to Bitcoin just to give someone a baseline for comparison, someone who's familiar with Bitcoin technology. Give us a little bit of a sense uh, of how it compares uh, and how it contrasts with Bitcoin, what you're working on right now. Well, I think uh, when when you're considering a, a central bank uh, currency, you, you already have uh, a, a system of authority, right? S saying that this is, uh, uh, you know, a, a euro or a dollar or whatever it happens to be. So, so you don't have this, uh, uh, you know, situation where you have to come to broad consensus upon whether or not this one transaction has or has not happened. So you can basically say, when you see that transaction, you can say that transaction has happened and that's final. That's never going to be reverted. In the case of Bitcoin, transactions can be reverted. Granted, the farther back on the chain that they are, the, the less and less likely they are to be reverted, but that, that is always a possibility. So if you don't have to come to that consensus and you can simply stamp transactions as being uh, uh, complete, then you're, you can, you know, it, it just lends itself towards doing things in a, in a slightly different way. You can think about something more like a validator. And rather than putting it on a network and coming to you know consensus upon which transactions are considered valid and and having to handle things if if you do a reorg, um, so th in that case it's different. Uh, in the case that um, you know if you think about the way you might set up a payment channel and through that payment channel send a lot of different transactions. This is kind of how a lot of, uh, you know, traditional messaging systems work. They, they secure a channel and then everything in the channel is essentially, you know, transactions that happen and they are not individually secured. This would be something like Swift would be using this model. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, which, which is similar to Bitcoin, would be you, each transaction is essentially an atomic unit. And that transaction uh, is secured on its own. And it doesn't matter what channel it's in. You 
change channels around, it wouldn't matter. Or you could just fire it off a single one and that transaction would kind of flow through the system. So, uh, you know, clearly we've borrowed a lot of things from the existing cryptocurrency world, Bitcoin in particular, right. Uh, for how transactions look and uh, how they work internally in the system. However, we do take some detours where it comes to coming to consensus. For us, it's not consensus of whether or not the transaction has happened. It's consensus to make sure that across all the geographically distributed locations, a majority of them has you know, permanently recorded that transaction. So it's a, that's a little different. Um, that's not to say, however, that for example, Byzantine fault tolerance might not still be valuable in this case. Uh, it can. Uh, it really just depends on, you know, how the system is built and, and you know, how the trust works within the pieces of the system. Um, you know, when, when you break something out from being a very monolithic thing to, to kind of having these tiers that I was talking about, it, it introduces possibilities for you to, to, you know, have to worry about messaging between different layers where you might not worry about that in the Bitcoin case. Hey there, revolutionaries. Thanks for tuning in. For more content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto and get unfiltered access to the most brilliant minds in finance and crypto. Join our community of lifelong learners for exclusive access, unparalleled education and unbiased insights.